गाइज आई एम डॉक्टर सुशील विजय फैकल्टी ऑफ ऑर्थोपेडिक्स विद डी बी एम सी आई एंड विद मी आई हैव वन ऑफ द यू नो ब्रिलियंट द मोस्ट एस्टॉनिशिंग फैकल्टी वी हैव फॉर पैथोलॉजी डॉक्टर प्रवीण राइट एंड बोथ ऑफ अस वी आर हेयर टूडे टू डिस्कस विद यू समथिंग वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट राइट एंड यू कैन सी दैडिंग वेरी वेल ऑन योर स्क्रीन दैट इज ऑस्टियोमलाइटिस नाउ वाई यू नो वाई वी आर टू टूगेदर द फैकल्टी फ्रॉम सेकेंड ईयर फैकल्टी फ्रॉम द फाइनल ईयर वाई वी आर टूगेदर बिकॉज यू नो द नीट विच इज नाउ गेटिंग कन्वर्टेड टू द नेक्स्ट कमिंग फ्रॉम ईयर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू राइट and this topic is something actually we don't realize in our second year that this is going to make a foundation for some important disease which actually you are going to read in your final year okay now with this misconception that we are only reading the final year subject and we are going to pass out the next exam or the neat exam is not actually going to work for us right this video is a simplest of the example which can actually tell you the topic of final year how it has got its base in the very second year right that you read in your everyday life in your pathology year but you actually forget right let's discuss about this topic osteomyelitis would you like to say sir something about this particular topic exactly sir sir uh, i think osteomyelitis is one of the uh, last few topics in robins which most of the second year students actually fail to read and then when you move to the final year they all are confused like what is happening there so because most of them have seen them asking me the normal histology of bone in the final year because uh, this topic is not very frequently read but as is very important clinically it's very very important and pathologically i hope we can make a genuine case today yeah. and make the students understand yeah as sir said see it is one of the last topics given in robins right but that doesn't make it any less important than any other topic why and how let's read it in a integrated way we are presenting another beautiful video one of the most important topic from dbmci let's hear it okay so osteomyelitis what do you realize from the simple word the osteo myelia and itis the itis inflammation osteo the bone and myelia which pertains to your marrow so infection of the bone and the marrow is what you call osteomyelitis now this simple definition is more than enough to tell you why it is one of the most important topic marrow the most innermost part of our human body there is nothing after that right so when the infection has reached to that core that means it can destroy anything this osteomyelitis is broadly classified into three types acute osteomyelitis sub acute osteomyelitis and chronic osteomyelitis these three osteomyelitis they vary in their own symptoms and presentations the signs and how actually what we see on radiology in each one of them for example the acute osteomyelitis most of the presenting features are clinical radiologically very minimal features we have right chronic osteomyelitis it comes up with something very very specific that we are going to discuss today as a part of this topic and sub acute osteomyelitis the localized form of which you all know is brodie's abscess what exactly is that in which the symptoms and signs they come and they go away off and on right the minimal signs and symptoms because of certain reasons right this chronic osteomyelitis that we are going to discuss today uh, i will be telling you some basic facts basic points and then specifically about the chronic osteomyelitis one most important thing we all should remember that any infection of the bone the primary route of spread to the infection to the bones is hematogenous right but do remember one very very important thing we said it is the most important route the primary route but it's not all the time it's not only the reason right so hematogenous remains the most common uh, source or you can say the route of infection to the bones other sources can be the infection from the adjacent sites it can be infection from a particular joint from the surrounding soft tissue nearby infection getting to the bones these are other reasons post operative post open fractures these are other reasons why a bone can be infected by particular organism right which organism when they ask you this question in your pgm exam one of the frequently asked question is about organism right most common organism overall for chronic osteomyelitis or any osteomyelitis it is staph aureus right that is most common why most common because that's a normal commensal of your skin that is staph aureus when they ask you about the most common organism in iv drug abusers then it is pseudomonas when they ask you about the most common organism in pa patients who are on prolonged parenteral therapy that is fungal osteomyelitis when they ask you about osteomyelitis in a patient of sickle cell disorder then it is salmonella when they ask you sometime about the uh, infection of bone after human bite organism remains your echinella and after animal bite that will be pasturella so these are simple organism now here i would like to clarify one very important thing it happens that many student what they ask me sir what is the answer for this question what is the most common infective organism for osteomyelitis in iv drug abusers options are two staph aureus or pseudomonas now what to answer so do remember guys when they are asking you about a specific condition it remains the specific organism 
staph is all the time overall most commonest organism answer has to be your pseudomonas right so these are your organism which produces osteomyelitis in any uh, any patient any person then uh, about the etiology and the site sir that's your part pathology and now you realize how important it is uh, you know friends when sir told that the most common uh, route of infection is hematogenous it is very important to understand that in children <clears throat> how does the root spread it has been seen that in children while chewing the hard food they don't realize but they have mucosal injuries sir so what happens with the mucosal injury these mucosal injury actually uh, the staff always as I told yeah. they get to the blood vessels of this children and then they move to the uh, bone that's one okay. side of injury second way is a uh, defecation uh, sometimes the uh, children also suffer from the uh, uh, problem in defecation that have have hard stool so hard stool creates a, a acute mucosal injury in the rectum area and that also where is the uh, this organism spreads via the vessels into the blood of, blood organism and the blood then moves to the bone okay. a third way is uh, chewing the skin that is the skin they have some small scratches and to scratch the infection as a sir told because then skin there's staph aureus so that staph aureus organism from the skin moves to the vessels and from it it can move to the bones and now having understood the basic way of infection <coughs> let's also understand the basic pathogenesis now uh, in this image as you see see what i've drawn is and uh, this is basically the bone part and i've drawn this as the haversian canal and this is metric cavity right so what happens is through the vessel the nutrient artery moves inside and it makes a loop in the metaphyseal area okay and this yellow part is the periosteum periosteum remember in children is not very firmly attached to the cortical bone there is a gap uh, a physiological gap not as any gap but it's not very strongly attached to the periosteal bone part okay so what happens the blood is moving from this metaphyseal area uh, from this uh, metaphyseal area and this makes a loops in the metaphysis so what happens the infection starts usually in this area of okay, the small infection pus collection gradually the pus starts spreading and in you see as you see in this image the pus has now broadened but what is the problem is because the blood moves from this metaphysis area to this uh, uh, making a loop there so the part of the bone uh, which is actually having the pus area is completely having ischemic necrosis so because of ischemic necrosis the part of that bone completely becomes dead so what you are seeing is this pus is now expanding gradually and as I told you, because this yellow part, which is the periosteum, is very, very lightly attached to the cortical bone, the pus gradually, it starts spreading out and it moves the periosteum above. So suppose this is the cortical bone, this is the periosteum, the pus is forming between them, okay? And the periosteum is now moving out. But the part of the entire bone around this area is not getting any blood supply. So the entire bone becomes ischemic and ischemic necrosis leads to a dead bone. The dead bone we'll see later on is called a sequestrum. Gradually what happens, as you all know, after necrosis, what starts is the, is the repair process. In the repair process, what comes is general pathology, that is granulation tissue. So the, now the granulation tissue along with the newly formed osteoblast activity starts forming up. And as you see in this image, I have drawn, tried to draw this green area. The green area is basically the collection of granulation tissue and the newly formed bone by the osteoblast now. This newly bound form area here, it is called as the involucrum. Okay. So uh, can I add a few things yeah. for the last image? See, this is wonderfully explained uh, according to the pathology scenarios. Now, I would like to add a few things. See, what sir has drawn a perfect thing. See here, this is what sir said, the metaphysal area, the blood comes here because of multiple mucosal scratches and so on. So why metaphysis is the most common site involved? This is because of the same reason that he has drawn already. That is a loop arrangement. So hematogenous root means the infection is already in the blood. So when the blood flows and it reaches the metaphysis area because of this kind of loop arrangement, you see, this loop arrangement, the blood flow has to slow down. And during that time period, the organism gets the time to, you know, inoculate or establish itself into the bone. That is one reason. Other reasons are we read in metaphysis, they say that, <clears throat> whatever book says orthopedic, it says that there is less phagocytic activity at metaphysis area. These are the two prime reasons why metaphysis is most commonly involved. Other things are added here. He has shown is beautifully. He has just drawn the image perfect. You know, small infection here. And then it gradually increased here the size of the infection. And this is what we on X-ray, what we see like this is subperiosteal collection. So periosteum will be lifted up and you see a white dense collection all below the periosteum. This is what you are going to call as a subperiosteal abscess. Right. Okay. Uh, now, now friends moving ahead so what we also understood is the infection broadly the main site is metaphysis but it must it is very important to understand that not in every age group the site is always metaphysis sometimes it can spread from the metaphysis also to the epiphysis 
So this is basically the growth rate of a neonate. It's not very completely fused. So because the metaphyseal blood vessels move to the epiphysis, the area of infection is both metaphysis and epiphysis. In a child, because now there is a growth plate formation, now what happens is the this is a capillary loop. The infection from metaphysis usually doesn't move to the epiphysis. But after the fusion, again in the adult, the infection is uh, can directly spread from the metaphysis again to the epiphysis. So concluding here that the uh, infection in a neonate is both in epiphysis and metaphysis. In a child, it is usually localized to metaphysis, and adult again it can go from metaphysis to epiphysis. epiphysis. Yeah, perfect. So this is what we call in orthopedics how we read it that there is a dual age for dual distribution. You can say for osteomyelitis, right? So in a younger age group, less than two years, the both sides can be involved. Then after the age of eight years, both sides can be involved. Why not commonly seen at the uh, uh, this epiphyseal area between the age of two to eight years? Same reason because they have got a dual supply: metaphysis having own blood supply and epiphysis own blood supply. That's the reason about the growth rate. Uh, now, friends, based on this pathological sequence, let's understand the morphological findings in the uh, osteomyelitis. So this is basically the bone part. As you see, there is a nutrient artery going on. This red part is the nutrient artery. The blue one has been shown as a nutrient vein, and they are making the capillary loop in the metaphysial area, and it has moved to the epiphysis area in this also. <coughs> Uh, now, the two parts, one is the acute, one is the chronic. What happens in acute is because there is a pus formation. The collection of pus, as you see here, is a localized pus, remember? And as it starts growing out, the pus starts becoming a uh, bit in size. So, the entire pus is where it starts here. And gradually, the pus is eroding the entire cortex. The pus is now coming out of the sinus. Sir, uh, I think this has a clinical implication, right? Yeah, I'll tell you. Sir, uh, what Sir just pointed out, have a look. This image, what is mentioned over here? Acute side. So, this side features are of acute osteomyelitis. And this side with the uh, features will be of chronic osteomyelitis. Now, here, what just Sir pointed out, this one is the abscess. Now, this abscess, when it increases in size, when it increases, you know, the quantity, it will just try to pressurize the cortex of the bone as well as the periosteum. This elevation of periosteum here, see this? This is what you call a subperiosteal abscess collection, right? So, there are certain, you know, hallmarks of chronic osteomyelitis. When do you call it a chronic osteomyelitis? See this, acute osteomyelitis will only show you the abscess, which will try to elevate the periosteum. So, subperiosteal abscess, that's all. When you turn onto the chronic side, see what is the difference? In acute, only collection cavity. But here what we are seeing, this piece of bone, this is a dead piece of bone, now which is what you call a sequestrum, right? So what are the hallmarks of a chronic osteomyelitis? For chronic osteomyelitis, we have got three important hallmarks. One is sequestrum. How do we define it? It's a dead bone. That's not complete. It's a dead bone. And this all area you see, all area around this dead bone, this is what you call granulation tissue, the pus. So dead bone surrounded by granulation tissue is what you call a sequestrum. So sequestrum is already dead. Point number one, do remember it. And it has got something very important to be linked to treatment part also. Okay. So number one, for chronic osteomyelitis, we have got the uh, the sequestrum, the dead part of bone, which is surrounded by granulation tissue. Now, uh, sir can uh, show you histologically also what happens whenever the bone is getting pressurized and when it is dying. See, every, uh, you know, structure in our body has got a protective mechanism. The bone has the same mechanism. Now, when this bone is getting dead, what will happen is this all area, surrounding area will increase its activity. Right, so to make a coverage all around the infective uh, pathology, that new bone formation or the reactive new bone formation is what you call involucrum. Okay, so we have got two entities. One is a sequestrum, dead bone surrounded by granulation tissue, and second is all new whitish. I'll just show you the X-ray after a while. Uh, that is what you call a involucrum, reactive new bone formation. Now, what is going to happen? Have a look here. This granulation tissue, which is all all the you know all around the sequestrum, this will keep on expanding. And whatever involucrum will be formed all around this cavity, it will keep on pressurizing it so that the involucrum ruptures from somewhere and it gives an opening, right? If you observe from where the vessel is coming out, if the bone perforates from here, that opening in the involucrum in the reactive new bone is what you are going to call a cloaca, right? Sometime when I ask my student in the class, what is the difference in a cloaca and a sinus? They say, sir, both are same. Sinus is what you see on the skin from where the pus actually comes out pus is pouring out when the patient is coming to you in the OPD. So patient comes to you and tells you, sir, I got a history of trauma some six months back. I was operated somewhere, implant was placed and now this pus is coming from the upper leg area. That pore, that opening onto the skin is what you call a sinus. So do remember, cloaca is an opening in the involucrum and sinus is an opening onto the skin. That is a difference. Okay, so sequestrum, involucrum and cloaca. That is what this image is trying to show you.
So let's move ahead to the histopathological diagram. And uh, see, this is a basic is a, a newborn formation here. I said this is a dead bone formation. As why it's dead bone because it lacks the lacuni. Lacuni, if you remember, they have the an osteocytes. They are the formation. They are seen in the actual living bone. So this bone is completely pink in color. Doesn't have any of such osteocytes and lacuni. Therefore, this is a dead bone. And what you're seeing is plenty of neutrophil infiltration. Okay. So had you been seen a sequestrum and an involucrum. It would have become a complete chronic osteomyelitis. In chronic osteomyelitis, what happens? This is a dead bone, and what you see around them is a mono cell infiltration. So, in acute, you find neutrophil infiltration. In chronic, what you see is a dead bone, and what you see is a mono nuclear infiltration, which consists of lymphocytes and mostly of plasma cells. So, this one, the last image you can see histopathological correlation. You have already seen, and now see what clinically we are going to see. See, uh, if you can just recognize this is a long bone, the lower part of the bone has been involved and you see this cavity, can you all appreciate that, this cavity, inside this cavity, this particular piece of bone is what you call a sequestrum, this is a dead bone and all black that is all around this is what is a granulation tissue, right, so sequestrum is a dead bone and now you can ask one very simple question, even asked in exam, if the sequestrum is dead, why the density of this bone is similar to a normal bone, how is that possible? It is all because of the reason that when the infective process was going on, the vascularity of that particular part of the bone was also okay. So there was a continuous exchange of minerals through the blood vessels. When the bone became dead, the vascularity was cut off. And now all the minerals are trapped there only. They cannot be taken out. That means there cannot be no demineralization now. We cannot take out the minerals. That's why the density of this particular dead bone is almost similar to the normal bone or it can be sometime more than the, that of the normal bone. Right? One thing. So this is sequestrum. This black area all around this is granulation tissue. This whiteness that you see all around, that is a reactive newborn formation all around the cavity. So this is what you call an involucrum. And now if the bone opens up from somewhere to give the way to the granulation tissue to move out into the soft tissue, that is what you will call a cloaca. This has been just last year, this was an image-based question in your AIMS exam, where they marked something in your exam. They asked what is a marked structure, right? And even some of us, we are confused. What was actually that? The sequestrum or involucrum or cloaca. So do remember the four entities, how they're differentiated. Sequestrum, the dead bone, right? Involucrum, all white around this dead bone. Cloaca, if there is an opening into the bone, that is a cloaca. And this is a margin of soft tissue. If there is an opening into the soft tissue on either one side, that is what you call a sinus, right? So these are four hallmarks for chronic osteomyelitis. And with this, I hope that you now realized how important chronic osteomyelitis is. And you have already read that, the base of that in your pathology. So oh, please sir. don't be and in a dilemma. Yeah, sir, exactly. student, they keep on saying that final year, why, what is the need of second year subjects? Exactly. When you so, don't understand yeah. the pathogenesis, it's very difficult to understand the treatment part and the diagnosis part. Exactly. And now when you understand this, I think the very simple thing becomes a complication, which may be a pathological fracture. It may be a squamous cell carcinoma. So, <clears throat> I, I so another, that... another two MCQs he just said, right? Pathological fracture, the most common complication related to chronic osteomyelitis. Second, the only malignancy that the sinus tract has is squamous cell, okay. same reason, the squamous cell, right, that will get into the sinus. So sinus tract only has one malignancy, that is squamous cell malignancy. And for the last, as sir said, the treatment part, you can only understand, he has shown you the, uh, the pathological strides. So treatment part is also basically dependent on that also, only. Chronic osteomyelitis, the first treatment would be surgery. Remove this dead area to get rid of it. For acute osteomyelitis, it is the uh, medical part. The management is antibiotic and then do any surgery if required, right? So base is there in your first year, second year only. Please don't try to run away from these subjects. These are the base of what I read or what I do on my patients, right? If he's not here, I cannot treat my patients. It's as simple as that, right? So I, I hope, hope friends, you have uh, understood this uh, video very well. And if you like the video, if you actually want more of these videos, do post us in the comment section and we'll be happy to make many more videos for you. Best wishes and I hope you do the best. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.